From the blackness of the universe, a spinning orb begins to form, and we go down through the clouds until we meet the landscape of this spinning form. Mountains, growths, plants, more and more things develop and spread over the surface of this planet. Trees, rivers, bodies of water, and from these bodies of water, organisms spring. Organisms with strange appendages, which over time develop into other strange appendages. Claws, wings, flippers, beaks. More time. Beaks, talons, fangs. Feathers, wings, snouts. More and more changes occur until these animals go to land, and then a crude, fumbling, four-legged creature, which eventually goes upright, and then eventually develops weapons, and suspicion, and anger, bows, and arrows, and animosity. This creature, later, wears a lorgnette, is sophisticated, smokes a cigarette, walks in a more sophisticated way. This creature then creates the internal combustion engine, cars, more and more cars, more and more ways to destroy this new world that has been created. More and more things arise on this created world, things that are seen, things that are heard. Looking out the window, I look and I see and I call on the phone and I watch TV and my heart pounds as I see what has happened to this beautiful world. Airplanes, airplanes, people leaving this world to a new world to create a new colony because what has happened to this world will destroy this world. All the trees destroyed, all of the animals extinct. There is nothing left in this world for us anymore. The purpose for our presentation today, the title is known as Building Blocks of Storytelling. And I know that these three days you've seen many fascinating pieces of literature produced for you. And today we're going to be talking about the what and the how of it all. And I thought, well, I would like to talk about some of the technical strategies and techniques of expressing stories. My purpose today will be to d identify and define some terminology, and then my sister will be illustrating the points that I am making. Many of the stories we'll, we will be sharing come from stories that our family and friends have shared with us and passed down through the generations. Most of these stories are original stories rather than translations. First of all, I'd like to talk a little bit about the history of storytelling for among deaf people. There's no research that's really been done with it. And there is a body of information about ASL linguistics regarding morphology and syntax and all those types of terms. But when it comes to poetry and discourse and things like that, not much has been done. So I'd like to encourage perhaps some of the researchers to take that on. So what I'm presenting today is not something that's based on research. It's based on things that I have observed and both my sister as well have experienced. And when we've seen good stories, we've analyzed those stories. And perhaps you'll think that what we share with you today is incomplete and that you might have some other aspects that need to be added as well. That would be nice and we would encourage that kind of feedback. Now, in terms of the history again, I went to a residential school for the deaf, and back in those days, we didn't have TV and caption programs, and of course, that has 
available now, but as children, we didn't have that. And I remember in the dormitories, in the evenings at the residential schools, we used to take turns telling stories to each other. And whenever someone had a really good story, then we'd ask more children to come and watch that person to repeat the story, and we took turns doing that. Now, we have other family members who are deaf, and I wanted to let you know that my mother it was a phenomenal storyteller. She often took stories from books and shared those, and, but she also always would read the stories and then figure out how to tell the stories herself in ASL, and we look forward to those times. We often would hurry to get into our bed clothes so that we could watch Mom telling her stories to us. And when she had taken a look at a book, we and she would share with us, we would ask for more, and she always would say, you've got to wait for the next day, and I'll tell you some more from this book, because she'd read a few chapters at a time and deliver them in ASL. And we often would watch these, and there were friends of hers who said that they always used to be fascinated with the way that she would tell stories as well. So these stories we have not yet published, but we have been carrying them on as part of a quote, oral tradition. They're very natural, and of course, over time, they're going to change somewhat, depending on the style of the particular person who's delivering the story. Now, you might wonder why we want to focus on storytelling. What's the, the value of storytelling? If you think about America and sign language, yeah, we look at language, but that word language, that's a way through storytelling that we can preserve the value of our culture and our belief systems through carrying on stories and sharing them with others. Now, there are different purposes for storytelling, perhaps teaching a moral lesson or something about our world, maybe for entertainment, and there are a variety of purposes for storytelling. And sometimes we tell stories to teach a lesson, or simply to share, simply to share language. So the first thing we have to think about is the goal, the reason for which we're telling that story, and that should drive how we deliver that story. We have to think about how we're going to share it. We have to think of the purpose. Is it to teach? Is it for entertainment? Is it for explanation? Is it for teaching? And so forth. And in order to make people think, is it to make them think or for them to enjoy the sign language itself? So we have to really analyze for ourselves the goal before we produce our story. Now, hearing people have a term is called intonation because their voices change with inflection to show emotion and things like that. Well, deaf people have that built into American Sign Language as well through visual imagery. For example, if you're walking, there's a way to inflect the sign for walk and show whether you're walking in a slow way or a fast way, and we call that visual imagery. And that's our equivalent of vocal inflection or intonation. Now, the purpose of that is that we want to deliver information visually for the eyes to see. We want that expression to be delivered to deaf people. We don't want to focus on something that they cannot hear. Now, I've shared a little bit about the purpose of storytelling, and it's something that's for people to enjoy with their eyes. And before I continue, we have to have a plan. So what do we want to share with our audience? Who are our audience, our listeners, our watchers? Are they people in the dormitories, high school students? So it's important, are they adults? Are they somebody from a club for the deaf? Or who are they exactly? Now, I do have an outline that I can share with you if you would like later on so that you don't have to take notes. It's also important to think about who the 
audience is. Are they males or females? What are the ages of this audience? And what's the culture? It's very important to understand their culture. And people from the South and North Carolina have a different type of culture than people up in the North. It's not the same, so we need to adapt our stories to meet the needs of those regional differences. Now, how do you mean if are you familiar with the sign Easter that I've just shared? Other people have different signs for Easter, okay? There's some common agreements here, but see, I'm, I have several different signs for Easter. Yes, I'm showing a variety of these signs that represent Easter, okay? So we have to find out what your regional signs are and then use those, incorporate them into our stories that we deliver. Now, let's talk about Easter. Maybe we've got a story related to that. And I have to think, I have to plan for my audience and how I could share that in the best way. Now, according to techniques and things that we need to put into it, um, maybe you'll think that, oh, I've forgotten. I'm going to share with you the techniques I think are important to do this. First of all, we have 11 of these strategies or techniques. And when we talk about signing space, we mean we have to have a right perspective. We can't have a limited signing space unless the person, of course, is shy and timid. Then we would want a very small signing space. But if we got a person who's very bold and so forth, we'd want to use a larger signing space. Everyday conversation, then we want to change our roles on the stage itself, change positions. That's what I mean when I use the term signing space. And when we talk about setting the scene, if we're talking about something that occurred quite a while ago in history, we might want to change our appearance through clothing, having something frilly and having hair that looks befitting the time that we're talking about. For example, women used to have bodices a long time ago. and. Uh, we might want to think about how the environment was back then at the period of time that we're trying to emulate. Maybe the houses were row houses and just stretched on forever. And then we'd see a steeple at the end with one church in the town. So we have to give that kind of visual information to set the scene before we tell the story. Now, also in terms of characters, some characters are shy, some have an ego and an attitude. We have to show that. So when we tell a narrative and we have a person who, for example, a guy falls in love with a sweet young thing, we want to show the character within each person. And so we can show that through our posture and how we move and just emulate the person. So we have to shift our roles by actually acting out the character within ourselves. Now, the period of time is very important to make sure that we've got everything matched up correctly. Never make assumptions. For example, back in that period of time when you tell a story, perhaps there was not electricity at the time. So you have to take that into account. So alarm clocks would be different. So you have to explain those kinds of um, details. So it's important to emphasize and make sure that people know what you know. For example, back a long time ago, there were different types of vehicles for transportation. So we also talk about role shifting. And I mentioned about um, moving before. Now we're talking about times when we have to actually step to a different part of the stage to indicate different characters on the stage. So we incorporate more movement into our delivering when we talk about changing perspectives we have to move as well For, let's say if we were going to talk about a rabbit and a turtle when we show the turtle going very slowly and then show the uh, rabbit from a higher level and 
very rapid kinds of movements and the turtle moves in a slow way, we can show perspective that way. Or if an animal is up in a tree or a bird's up in a tree, that animal, that bird needs to look downward and the animal would need to gaze upward into the tree. And that's what I mean by perspective. Now we also have a thing where we can uh, have inanimate objects take on personality. For example, the moving Beauty and the Beast. You have a teacup, and that teacup has a little baby teacup. And so the mother teacup walks along and she tells her little baby to hurry so we can take on the personalities of the two teacups when we're describing that in sign language. So we can do incorporate personalities into inanimate objects. Now, these are, I also have four things that begin, terms that begin with E that would help us to make a story come alive. And the first term that I use is elaboration. And I mean, describing something by elaboration. For example, if I'm a small child and I'm gazing up at Abraham Lincoln, the statue in Washington, D.C., and I need to go up the stairs to go and see that statue, I show as I'm climbing how long and high those steps are to me as a child. And when I get to the statue, I have to look way up to show the perspective involved. And that's what I mean by elaboration. And the second term I have with an E is that of enhancement. And by this, I'll give an illustration. If we want to show feelings or emotions or um, personality, it's very important to elaborate on that. For example, if a girl is shy, you don't just use the sign. You have to show how the person would move and how she would hold her head. Or if a person is a braggart, how they would walk in a very braggadocio way. And so we need to emphasize that. And then we move on to embroiderment. And that's very important as well. We have to show conflict of good and bad and dark and light, show anger and happiness. We show contrast and we have to somehow weave those together. And also, of course, we expression is very important as a fourth term and something to think about. We have to show our emotions. Some of you, when you've told stories, you show how a person can be plump or if a person's scared and how they manage to uh, walk along when they're scared. It's all important how you carry your body and show expression through your face. Also, we look at time. We can inflect our signs in a way that shows that time was a long time ago or that's going to be a great distance in the future, a great period of time in the future. Or if we are hearing something, we can show through rhythm that something's coming closer to us and we can show how scared we are. It's very important though to look at these aspects of storytelling. And we have to watch our audience as well and see how they're reacting to the way we're telling our story. If we're not getting the kind of facial feedback from our audience that we would expect in listening behavior, then we need to change ours accordingly so that we can make sure that we're meeting the needs and expectations of our audience. So that is very critical in terms of our delivery of stories to an audience. Now, if I were presenting on stage like this, and uh, you know, I'd do it one way, but if I'm in a classroom, then I'm apt to tell a story in a way that suddenly I could get the classroom to participate as well and ask people, who stole the hat? And somebody said, I know, I know. So I could actually stop the story and ask for people to participate with me and respond. So make it interactive in a classroom situation. Now, I'd like to put an overhead up at this point in time to set this up. And then we're going to pick some of these strategies to incorporate into the story to show you, to demonstrate.
Okay, you can look at this picture. It shows a lot of different movement in a different place. And you want to set it up for an example. How would you sign some of those things if you were going to use this picture in a story? Um, you, know, you see the rocks. You see the people's clothes there. How would you describe some of that? Oh, I'm sorry. You can't see me over here on this side. For example, you have a character change in that, like the rocks are real heavily laid out up over the hill, and you can see the dragon with the big teeth and the scales on it and everything, and you see the knight, you see the knight with his sword and everything, and you have the dragon with his tongue hot up there and the soldier looking at that and you've got the ram up there with his horns hanging over there and you have to describe the dragon with the eyes bugging out and his tongue flicking out of his mouth and him just breathing these heavy breaths and the big claws on the ends of his paws and just fire coming out of his mouth and the flame shooting across and the soldier drawing his sword out and and finding that perhaps it was stuck in there and he finally gets his sword drawn and he's looking at the dragon and contemplating cutting its head off um, and the girl you know maybe it described the girl as having nice clothes and being attractive sweet young lady with a bed headband on and um, and the fellow acting extremely macho and pushing the girl aside to protect her and stepping out in the path. You can see the kinds of changes that I made as I described that. Okay, and now I'd like to talk about the term genre. I still think that many of our stories, um, we're trying to fit into the forms of folklore and legend and so forth that are already existent in the spoken English language. But I'm not sure that we have really collected all the possibilities for ASL literature. And there are a lot of there's a lot of folklore and folk legend examples available. I'm sure there are some things that are similar between both English and ASL, don't get me wrong. But when we do talk about folklore, I took the term and the definition from the dictionary, and this is what we came up with. And that is something that's been passed down orally. Practices and beliefs, tales from a people. So it's been passed on over time and becomes a legend, and we don't know whether it's true or not. So there are always questions about it. Now Eileen is going to be, share some, be sharing some of her stories that are within that realm. Many, many stories as I was growing up I saw, and I watched them, and I've just kind of picked a few of them that I would like to share with you. Would you please step forward here? There are many, many stories um, that various adults have told. Oh, wait a minute, you interrupted me and made me move here, and I gotta get my train of thought back. All right. When I was a small girl, I was always fascinated by the story that the older folks would tell. I'd say, please teach me those. And there was one story, you know, a man who had told the story that really impacted me, and I thought, wow, this is really something. The story was just terrific. There's a deaf king in this country, and all over the land that the king had. Okay, I've got it together now. Let me get started here. All the people in the towns all over the land were deaf and hearing. And the king himself was deaf. And the king, who was deaf, called all of the villagers together and said, Come on over here. And the villagers assembled, wondering what was wrong. And the king said, I'm really angry. Somebody stole my crown. 
where is my crown? And the people were all like, gee, I, I don't know, I have no idea what happened. And the deaf king looked out over all of his people and he said, I've got an idea. All right, all of you folks get in a row and the men and the women all lined up and there were different folks there. There were thin people and there were big, strong, heavy people and there were some folks who really looked emaciated in that. And the king said, somebody's got to be lying here. He said, okay, bring this prisoner out from jail. So this prisoner came out and he was shackled and the chains were wrapped around his arms. And the king said, you see this fellow's guilty for stealing and he's been convicted of that already. I want all of you folks, I don't know who stole my crown, but I want you to see there's this big pot of water here. And it's a very special water. It's not your normal water. It's a special. It's very unique. If somebody does something bad and they dip their hands in the water, they'll come out blue. And that means they're guilty of doing something. And if they dip their hands in and come out and they're uncolored, that means they're innocent. And the villagers were all looking around and thinking, oh, wow, this is something special. And the king ordered that the prisoner immerse his hands in the water. And when they came out, they were all covered with blue. And the king said, you see? You see what happens when you're a guilty individual? Now he ordered bowls of water to be set for each person in the crowd. And one man was standing there thinking to himself, what am I going to do? He said, oh boy, I know what I'll do. I'll just act like I'm dipping my hands in the water and just barely touch the surface of it. So the king said, are you ready? Everybody immersed their arms. And all of the villagers immersed their arms. And the king said, raise your hands. And they raised their hands. And the king looked. And the first one was blue. And the second was blue. Everybody was blue. There was one person whose arms weren't colored and everybody else's were blue. And the king said, you're the one who did it. <laughs> now a second story. You know, imagine a king. The king is hearing now. And his hearing king thinks, I've got all of these villagers again, deaf and hearing commingled in the community. And the king assembled everybody and all of the villagers came and they were wondering what was up. And the king said, I want all of you to tell me a story, something that I can enjoy. Understand, tell me a story. I don't want you to stop. I'll decide when the story ends myself. I will tell you when it's the end. You can't decide that. So the villagers got together and said, what are we supposed to do? We have to create a story and we can't stop. We have to continue telling this story until the king can tell us to stop. What are we going to do? So the king commanded one man to step out front and the man stepped down and he started to spin this tale. And he came to the end and the king said, behead him. And the other men were like, oh my gosh, the second guy came up and he was trying to tell a story and go on and on and on. And he ran out of things to say. It came to the end. And the king said, behead him. And the next person and the next. And finally, there was a deaf woman who stepped forward. And she thought, oh boy, the people have dwindled. There's, our, our numbers are getting fewer and fewer. She had an idea. She said, I'll tell the king a story. King said, fine, step forward. So the woman stepped forward. She started talking about the tree that was over there. And there was a baby bird, a nest that was in the tree, and a baby bird was so cute and just chirped up in the tree, and a baby bird sitting in a nest and was just growing and growing and tried to fly as it got bigger and stronger, and it was finally ready to fly, and it practiced and practiced, and it launched itself out of the nest and flapped its wings, and it was really thinking, oh gee, I just can barely fly, and was getting stronger and ready to do all of this, and trying to get out of the nest a little more, and was inspired, and finally looked at the ground and 
flew out and thought, oh, I can do this. I'll be able to fly. And flew up just a little higher and felt good. And started to travel all over. And was just soaring above the land and flying. And looked down on all of the trees and the scenery. And saw the rivers as it soared through the sky. And the mountains she looked at. And all across the land and the various animals. And was just flying over the trees and soaring back and forth. And enjoy all of the sights in the world. And the king started to become sleepy and said, that's enough, that's over. And the woman was like, had saved all of the people in the land. And the people were so elated. They... That's a story a man told me when I was very small and it really hit me. What did it mean? He taught me something. I learned something from that story. It's a true story about what happened. It's a true story. You know, my family, my sister, when she was very small, you know, she had to hold the mom's hand when we were walking along. And my sister would always uh, be bothering my mother and hitting her and saying, Mom, what's this? What's this? And my mother was constantly being interrupted by my sister saying, what's that? What's that? She was so curious. So one day my mother was said, decided she was just going to ignore my sister. She had had enough of this. And my sister just kept poking her and poking her and poking her. And finally, my mother was exasperated. And she looked down to see what happened. And here, my sister had been looking up at a bird flying in the sky and a bird pooped right in the middle of her face. There's another one. That story really happened. I mean, you know, my mother, you know, uh, I worked at a residential school. It's a true story. I don't know if this is true or not, but it makes you think about something. A small girl, you know, in the girl's dorm. And, you know, have a line up getting ready to go to the bathroom to brush your teeth and wash your face and get ready in the morning. And the dorm parent or supervisor, this very sweet, soft-hearted woman, saw what was going on. And she would always sit in this corner in a rocking chair. And she would watch as the girls filed into the bathroom. And they'd all wave to her, and she'd wave. She's just such a sweet woman. And the girls all loved her. And in the morning, as they went in to take care of their toiletries and, and get ready for school every day, she'd sit there and watch them come by. It was the same old routine. And one day, she was absent. She wasn't there. And the girls, as they were lined up going to the bathroom, wondered what happened. And the superintendent of school, school came out and said, I have some very sad news. You know, the dorm mother who was always here has passed away. And the girls were just astounded to hear that she died. And they looked over at the empty rocking chair. And the next day, as they filed in the morning to go in the bathroom and get cleaned up and ready for school, they looked at the rocking chair. It was empty, but the chair was still rocking. And the girls looked at the window to see if there was the windows were open and there was a breeze doing that, but the windows were all closed and still the chair rocked. And the girls all thought about that. And as they grew up, it was the same. They'd come in in the morning to go to the bathroom, and that chair was always rocking. Okay, are you going to come back and go on with this next part? Hmm, I'm thinking about this here. Okay, okay, I have another one. I've got one more story I can tell. Oh, that oh, story wait, wait, about wait, the wait, small wait, wait, girl. Wait, 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 wait. Uh, Turn off your voice, please. The interpreter's been ordered to be quiet.
How many minutes do I have left? Ten minutes. All right. Okay, I think we'll move on to mystery. We have a lot of different examples. For example, the rocking chair could have a little bit of overlap between legend and mystery. Another story that I really enjoy was about my mom, my sister. But there are other ones. There are mystery stories. And some are scary and might not be appropriate for young children. So we have to think about the age of the children that we're telling the stories for. And now my sister will tell another one that's a mystery. One night out in a black, dark street, there was a white light. And as I walked down this long, dark hallway that was so black, with this white light just at the end of it, and kept walking and walking, and it just seemed such a dark, black night with that one white light at the end of the long hall. <laughs> and kept approaching it, and it seemed like an interminably long, dark, black hallway with a little white light at the end, which was wavering and moving around. And when you finally got it all tuned in and then watched the program, <laughs> Now we'd like to talk about romance and how much time do we have left? Seven minutes. I think we'll move on. We have a good story that's about romance. During the war, the German war, and it's about Jews. It's very touching. It's so long though about a couple that were separated during the war and then met again after the war. So we do have romantic stories like that and that is available in ASL literature. And we also have stories that have repetitive lines that are good for children because they can learn how to give and take in a chorus and rhythm. We have examples of that. And like the teeny tiny, teeny tiny house, and had a teeny tiny cat. And the teeny tiny cat liked to eat what? Little teeny tiny mice. And that's repeated. And there was a little teeny tiny mop lived in a little teeny tiny house. And what did she have? She had a little teeny tiny cat who liked to eat what? Small teeny tiny mice. And so that's how you play that kind of story with children. And we have lots of samples of that. Like there's a person who came with a man with a yellow hat. And who came? Yes, the man with the yellow hat. You're correct. He came to eat dinner. So we have lots of examples of like that. They're more interactive. And then we have rhythmic clapping stories. And Barbara Cannibal has a story that she tells that's just amazing. I don't know if you've ever seen it. But it involves rhythm and clapping. And Eileen, could you please show this for us? And then I'll explain about it. Um, you know, like a bunch of small children, maybe three or four years old, and you have a nursery, you have them in a nursery, you get them to clap, they can clap, they love that action kind of a story. You know, for example, Easter is near, so you can talk about the Easter Bunny. You can say the bunny has what? It's got this character, and it's got the long ears, and you say, fine, you pull somebody out that can say the long ears. It's got the big whispers, and it's got the big thumping feet, and of course, a cotton tail on it, and you can get the children involved in that kind of a story and they really enjoy that so follow me by clapping in rhythm clap 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 rabbit rabbit hop Run. ears hop hop whiskers hop hop the cottontail hop hop foot hop hop the cute 
And that's it. That gives you the idea of how you can get the children involved. And children just love that. Three and four year olds can do that and they have a tremendous amount of fun with that. And if you think that's only for children, that's not right because there are people who really do like that who are older. And even at Gallaudet, for example, they use rhythmic kinds of songs. And cheerleaders use rhythmic kinds of songs in their cheerleading. So we've seen samples of that. And there's one that's called Rye Whiskey. Rye Whiskey, yeah, Rye Whiskey. Is anyone familiar with that song that has a rhythm of clapping to it? And older people enjoy the rhythm. They have a sense of rhythm that when it's repeated. And perhaps it's difficult for children when they're young when they don't have a rhythm. So if you give them stories that have rhythm incorporated into them, it helps them to learn a sense of rhythm for themselves. Now, there's this word that's visual soliloquy. No, excuse me, interpreter error, visual onomatopoeia, which in English we have sounds and the term onomatopoeia that refers to that, but also in ASL there's a form of onomatopoeia that's visual in nature, for example, for alarm clocks and uh, shoes tapping and watching the repetition of that, that's a form of onomatopoeia. Sometimes you look at a leaf and you see it. Swish, 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 swish. And so that's an example or an example of visual onomatopoeia. Now I've given you a lot of different genres and you may wonder how can I start to in create stories. Oh, before I finish though, I almost forgot. There's soliloquy, and that's when a person in, it's a very complex kind of genre, where a person delivers a solo kind of performance. And you probably saw Julia Feld when she was telling her soliloquy. It was just fascinating. And Patrick Grable told one, called about the evils of chewing tobacco. And so I would recommend that, that's a real tough one to master, so you might want to start with, oh, with something a little bit more simple. Now, if we talk about fingerspelling and stories, I'd like to make some comments about that. It's important when you think about fingerspelling not to use too much. You have to really restrict how much Thing, how many things you go ahead and fingerspell if you want to emphasize something. You might go ahead and fingerspell a word like alien or something like that that would be used in a story. So you don't really use it that much. And when you do fingerspell, you should do it very slowly though in a pronounced way. And other things I've seen is that when you're telling a story, you have to know the difference between pantomime and telling a story itself. We certainly can incorporate parts of pantomime, but when you're telling a story, for example, talking about monkey, if you take on the characteristic of a monkey and just jump around, that's not really part of the story. That's a description of the monkey itself when it's scratching itself and how it does that. That's fine if it's a part of the story. But if you just become completely the animal itself, that draw goes across the line into pantomime rather than storytelling. Now, one thing I hadn't thought about before, but in Nancy Drew stories, you see that things come in and, and mime is at it. And maybe that's important. I'm not so sure. So we need to do some research in that. So I have a lot of suggestions for strategies, and they're all included in the outline that I have available for you here. You might want to take a look at them yourselves and think about them. Thanks so much. And I would also recommend that 
If you look at cartoons that have no words to them, and I'll show you one here on overhead, those are good to start with to practice describing them in the mirror. One of my favorites is once I've done it, I look in the mirror and look at myself and then I realize it doesn't look so great. So I test it out on my children and my family and people who know ASL. And if they look at me like they don't get it, then I know I've got to do something else to make sure that it really expresses it well. So I keep trying until I've got it adapted to a point, you know, and, and of course these things are never the same. You're always working on them to make them better. Okay, so if you take a look at this cartoon up here, there are no words. And so you could use something like that to get you started on how to express things because that way you don't get bogged down in the English. If you look at English, then it's very hard to be creative. So if you look like so, something like this without English, then that makes it a lot easier. Or you might want to look at a couple of things that have just a couple of sentences or look at folklore and try to take on the character of a person and uh, change before characters. Or perhaps you might want to look at ch children's storybooks that have one or two lines and ponder how you could tell those stories. And I do have a book here that I really recommend. And it has some, some really good story telling things in here and it would be good to practice them. So if you'd like to know more about it, I do have an address where you could get hold of this book if you'd like. I'll put that up on the screen. Now, I've shared with you some ideas and on the overhead how you can start, but I want you to think about children who are being mainstreamed and are, I'm so concerned that maybe we're going to lose this, that children are going to have the benefit of storytelling. So we've got to do something more. And so I realize it's really critical to encourage people to go into the schools and tell stories to their children and to pass on that oral tradition through the generations. I have some other strategies of how to do that, and I'm sure that you could think of some yourself. And even if you don't work in a school or a community, you could still volunteer your services to tell stories to children, maybe in a public library or at a carnival, a state fair, and go with an interpreter and do it. We really need to get this word out and do more of it for children. Where am I? I enter through a portal and walk along a landscape. Over there, a stately deer regards me. And as I look at this landscape and work my way through it, I notice the portal is diminishing, getting smaller and fading into the background. A beautiful glittering stream flows nearby. I crouch near the stream's waters and gather them in my hand to refresh myself. And as I reach down for more water, I see reflected in the water the shape of ears and a snout, glittering eyes and a salivating mowl, breathing heavily. As I move, the wolf moves. And I retreat and then start to run, the wolf in hot pursuit. I run as fast as I can, feeling his panting breath behind me as I make my way through the trees, through the forest with him so close behind. And I see another portal, and I run towards it as fast as I can to escape the wolf who's gaining on me. Faster I go until I throw myself through and arrive on the other side to a dark space all around me. And I look at myself as if separate from myself, this portal has disappeared, and I'm lying there. All is darkness, and I feel somebody tugging at my arm. Hey, hey, tugging at my arm. Yo, you slept too late. Come on, get up. We got to get out of here. What? What? Leave me alone. And then as I sit up in bed and my friend turns, I see behind him, a wagging, long, furry tail. Ah!